thinking that everybody has free will. And sorry, this is getting on a tangent, but he's trying to like paint the picture so we can understand these other questions. So he's saying each individual is using their free will. And in those yes or no moments, should I do this or this? There's a version of you that chose the other thing. And there's a version of everyone else that chose other things as well. So collectively, as, the, as a society, as a, as a population on earth, every, like, there's versions of us that made the other decision for everything. So imagine now that, and the world, like how it affects the planet. And so there's other timelines where other things have happened. Like, there, I think there is probably a world war in another timeline. There, is, there are things that were such on a delicate balance and that we collectively teetered it over like, boop, okay, phew, you know, but there's ones that we didn't eat and we went the other way and, you know, something happened. But as far as like cosmic events, that's, that's very far beyond. Like humans may not even perceive earth the same way by then. Like it, it's so far in our future. Like it's, yeah, not even worth thinking about basically. <laughs> so is it kind of like a choose your own adventure book, but Johnny chose path A but there's also, he did choose path B. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's okay. all. Yeah. There's basically. All right. Um, Jing asks, there's so much to talk about the second wave of events slash depression that's going to happen in the next six months. What's the best way we can prepare to weather the storm and come out the other end intact? Okay, grandpa. Here he goes with the philosophy. Okay. Um, so he's showing me, and I think, I feel like he must, this feels familiar to me. I wonder if he showed this to me before. He's showing me the, this little video of a rock in a stream and the water is just going over the boulder and it's just continuing on. So we, it's almost like being still while all this other stuff washes over because there's so many aspects of it that we can't do very much to um, control. And that's not a bad thing. He's saying there are things that are destined to play out in this timeline that have to happen. And there are repercussions because the energies have to balance. Even in this lifetime, energies are constantly trying to counterbalance. People call that karma or whatever. So earth is counterbalancing its energies into a different, you know, vibration. And that's going to cause stuff society is breaking down because it's trying to counterbalance old energies that it's ready to to rise to another level so everything is in the process of shifting and it's trying to stabilize he's always saying don't 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 put that extra burden on yourself of trying to push against that current you know he's saying that um it will balance out inevitably it will balance out and so almost like conserving your energy like there are important things to, to rise up against, right. And stand and stand up for. But as far as like, you know, you kind of have to pick your battles, like pick the things that are most important to you that you want to spend your energy on, because there's so much that we can't possibly process all of it as a person healthfully. Right. So he's giving that analogy of the water just kind of flowing over the, over the rock in the stream. And you're just kind of staying steady and just focusing on being the best version of yourself that you can be and knowing that the world is going to continue to have things happen around us. Um, and having that, releasing that resistance will make it easier to process. Um, and it's okay to not have to let yourself be bombarded by every single bad thing that's happening, like every single chaotic thing. Like that's just not feasible our consciousness is, we're still learning the depths of our consciousness and we're all like awakening and also we're in this information age. So he's saying where he's showing us getting like barraged energetically all the time and it's not healthy for us. So he's saying it's okay to create that, that limit for yourself. So whatever happens, just stay, just, yeah, stay anchored in your life. Okay. Easier said than done. <laughs> it is. Definitely. It's a challenge for sure. All right. It's a random question. There is the rich class, middle class, and poor class, et cetera, in this world. So mm. some people, some souls decide to be born to rich families, some born into poor families. But 
For example, if the playing field was leveled out and everyone was born with, let's say, $100,000 to start off with, how would that look? How would that play out? So would it still look the same as today where, let's say, some people will just gamble their money, end up being poor, some people know how to invest, or will it look different? Would have had looked differently? This is what's interesting. So he's talking about the mix between destiny and, and free will in people's, in each individual's path. There's no, the formula changes, right? Depending on our soul's personal journey. Um, so he's talking about, like he's saying, okay, <laughs> let's say that everybody tomorrow was given $100,000 by the government. Some people might have a certain destiny attachment where they, they have a specific part of their destiny that before they incarnated, they wanted to be tied to that. Because when you before you incarnate, you're going to see kind of some the general energy and you're going to see the big things that you can attach destiny markers to if you want to. And other people, that for them might be more free will. So some people will have a destiny to do something. Some people will be like, let's say, oh, I'm going to start a foundation with that money or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, it's my destiny to have a mansion, <laughs> I don't know, to have that experience from being really poor to suddenly being able to buy like a really nice house or something. Um, I was thinking mansion, like it's a hundred thousand dollars. Like that'll get you a uh, one bedroom, like condo uh, in the middle of the desert. I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, so, <laughs> but he's saying that others will, it'll be more free will. Um, where they might kind of just choose to do whatever with it. You know, that's not like everyone is going to have some substantial thing in their life with that. So um, it's fascinating. It's different for everybody. So it's not like you could say definitively if that would solve the world's problems, because he says it's dependent on the individual's path and how that, let's say, infusion of money plays out with what they've chosen for life. So it's all, it's a little bit contingent in those ways, if that makes sense. All right. Um, another random question. These are all random questions. So <laughs> is there a reason people are attracted towards certain cultures or looks? Like for example, some people are like, I'm attracted to certain ethnicities when it comes to a partner or they're excited or drawn to another country's culture for some reason. For example, they weren't born in Japan or anything, but they just grew up. Um, it could be like uh, African-American or a white person being like, you know, I just love Japanese culture. And so what influences that? So it does have to do a little bit with past lives or is it being growing up surrounded by certain people or environmental factors? Mm. So he was showing me a lot of different possibilities actually. So let me straighten them out and kind of just go one by one. So he's saying some of it does have to do with our soul's familiarity to those cultures. So, um, and that's where, so he's saying there can be some complications to um, how we perceive people who are not of those cultures using those cultural components, those, or, you know, those ethnic components as appropriation, right? Um, but yes, in some cases, the soul is familiar with those cultures, may have even had several lives in those cultures, but he's saying people do have to remember that the context of this life does weigh on things. We have to remember that to respect one another, um, even if we feel drawn to those things. We, so, so, you know, um, he's talking about also that it energetically, not necessarily the culture itself, but there's something energetically that resonates with that person's energy and something that they've decided to experience in that lifetime. So he's telling me some people choose to incarnate as someone from a completely different culture than they end up actually emulating. Like it's to have the experience of being an outsider and trying to fit into that culture. It's, in, it's important for some souls to have that experience of being an outsider to that, that culture. And while we might find it sometimes like offensive, you know, we might find it sometimes, you know, there's, if we, depending on how the person looks or where they come from, you know, it can offend us even. But yes, some people do just feel drawn to that um, experience of being an outsider and trying to assimilate to a culture on their own free, uh, their own volition. 
So that's kind of the main ones he's showing me. Oh, but also, oh, here's a third one. Some people are here to teach people about respecting other cultures by violating that respect. So people who use these flagrantly, like take things from other cultures flagrantly without understanding or giving credit, they're here to teach us a lesson about understanding each other's sacred traditions and our ethnicities and our ancestry. So there's a lot of that going on because that is an important lesson that has been overlooked by humanity so much. So now it's really coming out and you, it, it's, it's like finally people are starting to really learn about the respect of sacred traditions and things like that without just taking them because they like them. So that's also another societal lesson that's coming through. Wow. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is a funny one I came up with. So the term Karen, quote unquote Karen, grew huge this oh year. Oh my God. He just said it in his accent. <laughs> He's just giggling to himself. <laughs> oh, is he just like, Karen? Is he like, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So in case people watching that don't know, it's used to describe someone that seems entitled, demanding more than what's appropriate or necessary, demanding their own way. So grandpa, how did this quote unquote Karen person become the way they are today? And are they supposed to teach us anything? Oh my gosh. So his first question, his, first, his, area, his biggest area of curiosity is like the hair. Like why the hair? <laughs> <laughs> he just thinks it's absurd. Like, I don't know. Like, he finds it entertaining for some reason, the hair. Okay, so the Karen hair. Um, so, <laughs> but he's like basically saying like, jo like okay, like I'm done joking. Um, <laughs> He likes to throw in a little bit of humor here and there. So he's talking about how, okay, so he's talking about like a recipe, like, like if there were a dish, like how you would create a carrot. <laughs> Sorry. He's so adorable. I love him. Um, so he's saying some of it comes, the part of, one of the big aspects of this recipe is a sort of isolation there's some sort of isolation earlier in their childhood that comes from um, not having context, enough context of the world around them. They may have come from an insulated community or insulated family, uh, religion, schools, et cetera. Like they didn't have enough, um, uh, enough of a, a opportunities, I guess, earlier on in their life. And as they continued to grow up, they kept isolating themselves still because that's what's comfortable. So they found other isolated people to make them feel better about being isolated from cultural perspective, from, um, you know, being educated about people's histories and culture, because he's saying we do what's comfortable for us. And they're very defensive about their comfort zones because they know so little about these things that they were isolated from. So they're defensive and aggressive at times because they are so um, out of their element. They don't even know how to process those things. So almost like he's talking about how like their consciousness almost atrophied because of the lack of stimulation of, and, and, and perspective that was basically not given to them at growing up. And like I said, they, you know, they insulate themselves as they get, get older as well. So he's talking about how that makes them fiercely defensive of their ideals. It's like, just like how some people are the opposite and are fiercely defense, defensive over being aware. And they're saying, how could you not be aware? Something's wrong with like, like how, like they can't understand how someone cannot be aware. And then the Karen can't understand how to be aware. So then you have people who are hyper aware and people who are not aware at all. And he's showing the war, the battle. And there's, there's, um, and it creates this almost impossible energy. When they come together, he's saying they're like two rams, like, you know, butting those horns together. Um, so yes, it's from isolation is a big part of it. Isolation from 
and, and, and atrophy of consciousness because of them being too insulated growing up. But also he's talking about emotional issues. Okay. He's saying some of them were not taught how to deal with the feeling of guilt. And what may have been modeled for them was maybe being angry instead of admitting being wrong, right? That was probably modeled to them. Um, not being able to handle the feeling that they did something wrong. So he's saying some of these people may actually have some like a personality issue, personality disorder, where they're fragmented in some way. So basically, um, that's another, there's some Karens that are like that. They also have a psychological component that they actually, their, their brains like missed out on the process of processing a, a range of emotions because of that isolated type of environment, right? So they, they don't know what to do when they feel a certain way. So they just freak out. Like that's, they're just, oh, I'm just going to freak out and defend myself because I'm afraid of what's happening to me. And it's like, they don't, they didn't have that the, those talks when they were younger with people around them saying, oh, have you ever thought about this perspective or this or putting yourself in these people's shoes? They, they just imagine missing that, you know, and that's, and that's the recipe for creating like a Karen casserole, basically. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I'm just still laughing about how he complained about the hair. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, this one. Why does manifesting seem to not work for some people? Are they doing it wrong? Why can't we all say, oh. I am going to win the lottery next year and we all win the lottery at the same time. So it's kind of like, how can everyone have the same thing? But, you know, maybe it's not our soul contract to win the lottery. And how would we know that we are not supposed to win the lottery and not be like, man, manifestation doesn't work. He enjoys this question. Um, he almost has like a little like mischievous, like, like, you know, look on his face. Um, well, the first thing that he said was manifestation works because if you're not manifesting, it's working. Like, because you're not choosing not to manifest. So you're not manifesting. Like he's basically saying your energy, you're manifesting the opposite of what you want because you don't truly feel you deserve it. Let's say or you don't true, like, so you're actually, it's actually working. The universe is actually manifesting what you're thinking on a subconscious level. So it's not that it doesn't work, but that's just a very top level thing. So he wants to talk about, you can call it contingencies, things that are contingent on your contract. So yeah, some people are going to manifest a large sum of money, but they had maybe put in their contract that they wanted the experience, their soul contract, the experience of manifesting and the lessons that come with inheriting or winning a large sum of money. <clears throat> now, um, it's, it's complex. You can't just blanket say like, well, my next door neighbor keeps manifesting all these like nice cars. Like, why can't I have that? And it distracts us from our own path. And so he's saying we're too busy looking at what what they have and we want to manifest that we miss out on manifesting the things that are best for our soul's journey and our soul's contract. Because if you have destiny interfering with things that you want, that you want to manifest, it's just going to not really click very well. But if you are manifesting things that are along a range of experiences you wish to seek in your path and you're using your free will to manifest those things along the way, then you, you can very well manifest all kinds of things. So it's, it's definitely, um, it's a contingent on your, on your soul contract and what you're here to learn. And we just need to focus on manifesting what's best for us. And so he's talking about ego. He's saying ego is what most people are, when they see this thing about manifest what you want now, like in those videos and, you know, things that are going on online, he's saying they don't realize they're actually using the least powerful type way to manifest. So he's talking about how people are distracting themselves with using their beautiful manifesting power on things that actually might dis distract them or detract from their path because it's out of ego. Um, so that's another way to think about it. If you have a goal and you feel very drawn to something, I'm not talking about like just winning, winning the lottery. It's about like 
understanding yourself, he's saying, going inward, understanding what you need in this life, what you feel drawn to. And then you can use manifestation to, as stepping stones to get to where you feel you want to go. But of course, we have to deal with, he's talking about um, blocking those or manifesting the opposite of what we want because we don't feel we deserve those things as well. So that's, you can tie that in along with keeping in mind that we have our own journeys that we have to keep in mind and we don't always cognizantly know all the things that are on our path. So we just have to almost surrender a little bit. And when you surrender, you actually can manifest faster because you're removing the blocks, you're removing expectations, you're removing subconscious fears that are messing with you and, and manifesting the opposite. So that's kind of what he, what he was showing me. Right. Uh, Clara asks if someone suppressed their abilities for years, let's say like five plus years out of fear, is it too late to learn to use them? Mm. No, he's saying it's never too late to learn but he wants to talk about fear. He said fear is, so he's saying when we talk to grandpa, he might bring up fear a lot because fear is something that he has found um, is like the great blocker, the great blocker of things. Um, and it is a powerful manifester. And if we are, he's saying afraid of our abilities, we manifest not abilities. <laughs> we manifest the blockage of those. But understanding that fear again, just like time and um, is, is something that's relative, you know, um, fear is different for everybody. And also um, understanding that there's something else there besides just the abilities that's creating the fear. What's deeper than the fear of the abilities? Is it the fear of loss of control? You know, is it the fear of being wrong, doing something wrong? Is it the fear of the unknown? What's the real reason behind the fear he wants you to ask you? And he encourages you to dig into that and to find the root of the fear. And he's saying that this can help you in life in general. Um, but he's saying there's no reason to fear those abilities um, and that you will be able to um, let them in, let them manifest more. <laughs> when you start to break down why you're fearful. But they're I'm just gonna, gonna, oh, I'm go just gonna plug this in because it's perfect for it. But uh, Maria and I are actually in the works of creating a developing your psychic intuition course. So where, you know, people, a lot of people are asking for it. And so it's a place where people can feel safe and not scared and, you know, not scared of seeing spirits, things like that. So just look for it. It'll be probably in like a few months, but. Um, so, yay. uh, so I'm going to kind of spin this a little bit with fear and I'm going to kind of head towards mental illness. So just a heads up mm -hmm. for anyone that this is just a little, um, what do you call that warning? Like if, mm -hmm. if maybe about warning, I might be bringing up abuse, that type of stuff, um, mental illness. So with fear, trigger you know how we're like, yeah. yes, Thank trigger. You. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, let's say there's fear and it blocks us, but what about people that have mental illness where like you can't stop thinking about it because it's ingrained, like you feel like it's ingrained in you. So my question for that is where does mental illnesses like anxiety, OCD, depression, bipolar, sch schizophrenia, does it, where does it stem from? Does it actually stem from, let's say like trauma as childhood, or is it actually something like genetics and like, ah, you know, you just were born in this wrong family or your soul chose that family that has Gen X to it. Mm. Again, he's like, this is big, big, big question, big answer. Um, so it's all of that really. Um, he's saying some people will uh, seek in their soul's journey to incarnate into a life where there's, you know, a strong genetic component and maybe they're there to teach their family, maybe through their growth and curiosity, they might help to heal the family. Maybe the family will experience it together and it'll teach them about boundaries or teach them about what is control. Like what is control, right? That, that, that's trippy to think about. Like we think we have control, but what is it? And so sometimes that's a lesson that people who have um, mental illness can 
can learn about um, if they choose in, in life. Another one can be um, to kind of experience this, these other, basically some mental illnesses can really affect your perception of what we perceive as reality. And so for some souls, that challenge of reality is another thing they might seek to learn. Um, and some people, it, some souls might um, be curious about how um, a soul can lose their sense of self through something uh, like a trauma, something that was inflicted upon them. And that can teach them about finding themselves again or about you know, what it is to have something taken from you and, you know, and what happens to a person. I mean, it's really, it's so hard to hear this stuff as a human being and be like, why the F would anybody ever, like, as a soul, be curious about that. But when we are not in these bodies, we have such a vast understanding of how infinite we are and how actually, um, how whole our souls are and it is not the same gravity as we perceive it here in this in this world because there's so many things we understand that is difficult for us here so um yes it could be any of these things and then some what he's showing me um, but it really a lot of it is really about challenging what reality is, what, what is independence? What is reality? What is, what are boundaries? What, you know, um, what is healing? I mean, there's like infinite lessons you can, and as someone with mental illness, I can tell you that, I mean, having mental illnesses has taught me so much about, I mean, it has been a powerful teacher. And while I felt burdened with those experiences, I am now starting to understand the deeper meaning on a soul level. And I'm weirdly like, okay, I, I think I'm getting it. I think I'm starting to get this and it makes it a little easier, you know, but it's never a hundred percent easy, but it just gets maybe a little easier. So yes, he, he wants you to know it's a big set of possibilities for those. Um, so there's some people that have encountered abusive relationships, toxic relationships, and uh, maybe it is, you know, the soul chose that. And so how does one deal with, let's say, a difficult, toxic, narcissistic parents or family members? And sure, you know, there is always, they're like, set your boundaries. But, you know, with family, it's so hard because when you live with them, they just keep pushing. When, even when you're like, no, you know, they'll keep pushing it. And, you know, there's people where like they, you as a kid, teenager, young adult, you financially depend on them to pay in, for your schools, meals, et cetera. So I guess from your point of view, Grandpa, is there like a best way to deal with it? You know, you could either run away from home, but then that also is a hard life or you can be with a family. That's still a hard life. Is there like a faster way to finish the lesson? <laughs> you know, Grandpa's not about shortcuts, man. Um, but he, first of all, he has so much compassion. He just washed over me with so much love and compassion for people who are suffering in this, this type of life um, where they have someone who is an oppressor who is impossible and you can be as perfect, you can make yourself as perfect as you think you are and, and it's still never going to be good enough for them, right? Or they're always going to want a hold on your life. So he's just, first of all, expressing so much compassion for people who have to deal with this. And while there's not necessarily a shortcut, um, and that's something he's very passionate about because there's so many lessons in the in-between, you know? Um, we're not here for shortcuts, okay? <laughs> we didn't come here because it's fun. Sometimes, some of us did, but um, we're, we're here for those in-between in lessons as well. And the more of those lessons we learn, the less of less times we have to reincarnate. So some of us are like, load me up, baby. <laughs> like, but we know that in, on a soul level, we're very, very strong. We're powerful beings. So he wants you to know that even if someone is, is giving the, the illusion that you're powerless, just know that you, you are incredibly powerful. And we may not, we may forget that because someone is abusing us so much that we lose sight of that. 
but creating very sharp, harsh boundaries is sometimes the thing you have to do. Even though you might trade one set of hardships for another, your sovereignty, you can't put a price on that. Your freedom from that person is, you just can't put a price on that. And I know there are many people who have taken that path and felt it was worth it because at least it was a decision they made. So he's saying in a lot of cases, you, you will eventually just have to get away from this person with by whatever means necessary so that you can go on the journey of, of learning that you actually are really powerful and that they were not exercising power by doing that to you. They were very exercising weakness. So people who sit in their, truly sit in their power don't do that to other people. People who are afraid and weaker do that to other people who abuse other people. So that's a lesson that you learn along the way. But yes, in a lot of cases, you have to just make a sharp cut and find, a, find some way to get away. And, 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 and of course, there are cases where the person is literally like a prisoner. They can't get away. You know, these are, it's very complex. We can't, we can't, you know, we're not doing it justice by summarizing when there's infinite amount of possibilities. But for in general, talking about people who have narcissistic family members, friends, relationships, a lot of times the person escaping is, however hard it is, it will set them on a journey of self-discovery. Um, so for those who are, um, let's say they're hesitant or resistant to seeking help, like therapy, journaling, I can't do meditation, it doesn't work, meds, it doesn't, I don't feel like I'm myself with meds, you know, what can we do to help them or do we get them help or just kind of let them ride their journey? What service are we doing by trying to force something on them? That's what he's saying. Why do we feel so important that we feel our opinion is the most powerful opinion? So he's saying that that's where humans, out of the kindness of their heart, can misstep a little. If I mean, there really is no misstep. But in, in our, in our con, the way we perceive the world, we might make a little misstep in trying to help someone. Um, but we're imposing the lessons we've learned on our journey onto them when maybe that's not what they need right then. And, you know, this is me jumping in now in working with people all the time who are in the darkest parts of their lives. I don't sit here and, and impose some radical thing on them because I think I'm so enlightened and I have all the answers and that they need to hear that. Sometimes the very best thing you can do, and now this is him coming in again, is is letting them walk that path until they see it for themselves. That is when it's so powerful. And people can get stuck in really caustic, toxic relationships by, keep think by thinking continuously that they can change somebody and they can make them see the light, right? I mean, you're not only distracting yourself from your own path, but you're also distracting them from their path. And while we can offer loving suggestions and things, it's best to, okay, you offer your suggestion, but then they have to decide what to do with it. And you can't make someone go to rehab. You can't make someone get help. There has to be, and that's why you hear the term rock bottom, because there is an energetic pit that they have to sometimes fall into before, oh, this is interesting. He's talking about while they're falling down the well, all they see is darkness because you're looking down towards the ground. When you finally hit the bottom of the well and you look up, you see the opening and then you see the light. That's the metaphor he's showing me. Wow. Great metaphor. You um, know, Grandpa, he's <laughs> full of metaphors and analogies. <laughs> uh, when a person, okay, when a person does, let's say, a meditation short or long, but you know, you sometimes you're like, you can't focus because you're just like, God damn it, I have a list of things to do. And then you're like, wait, forgot, breathe in, breathe out, you know? And so you don't feel like that meditation was really um, the best session. So was it a waste or do you see there's a little still a change of physical, energetic or spiritual change in a person? Hmm. He's saying the restlessness itself is a lesson. It's an insight. That's what he's saying. 
the restlessness, the distractedness is a lesson and it is tell it's speaking to you. It's teaching you. And so he's talking about not being so hard on ourselves and we can't be this, like, we're like, you know, sitting in our yoga pants, you know, and like this perfect harmony with all these crystals and, you know, and candles. It's, it's really not, I'm sorry, I'm laughing at Hannah's awesome gift. For, <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, welcome, Hannah. Um, so basically he's talking about, oh, okay. Okay. So he's talking about training, how you mentioned classes, how we've created classes in our society. It's like people have created classes around meditation, like, like, home. Oh, well, like I'm an expert and I astrally project and I, you know, it's like people are like, oh man, why can't I do that? And it's like, why are we competing about meditation? <laughs> meditation, the experience you have with every meditation is exactly the experience you're meant to have. And those difficult experiences when you're meditating, he's saying, are the most powerful ones a lot of times because it teaches you what you're trying to push out all day long. Why are you running away? That's what he's saying. Why are you running away? That's valuable information. Take it in, feel the discomfort, understand it, understand that it needs to have a voice. It needs to be heard. Um, some people he's saying who get really good at, you know, just having such a peaceful meditation might actually have just learned to tune out to their own intuition, ironically because they're so afraid of being inconvenienced by those thoughts and those inputs during meditation, right? So he's saying it's, it's actually very ironic that, you know, you're a human being, you're gonna have complex things going on. And it's very, very unrealistic to think that your meditation should be this always this peaceful experience. He's saying there are some meditations that maybe are like guided or whatever that can help you to maybe adjust to a certain frequency for that time. And you, sometimes you might feel like you're like, you can actually lock into that frequency. But um, he's saying, listen to it and, and thank it for speaking because it needs to be heard. So, and, and do not judge yourself if, if you can't get still during metaphysical exercises, practices and meditation and, and other such things. Okay. And then, so we have only a few minutes left. Um, Okay, so a little bit about the future. I know that Maria, you channeled this when we were talking before, but um, just want to share it with the group. So we're in the year 2020. Can you give us a little glimpse of what the possibilities of what the year 3030 could look like and what advancements you're looking forward to the most? Okay, he's smiling. So he's like making me smile. I guess he's like excited about it or I don't know. Um, I'm excited too. <laughs> he's almost like saying something along the lines of like isn't it a relief to think about another time you know just to like get outside of 20 he understands the curiosity because he sees us getting pounded over here in the good old year 2020 um so he's saying interesting wow okay um he used the word harmony and he said, harmony between man and machine or man and technology, um, hybridization between man and, and technology. So he wants to make another point here that this is a possible timeline of 3030 based on right now. Again, like we talked about earlier, he was chatting about the different potentials and parallel realities. Um, but this is a likely potential by 3030 as of this moment, he's talking about this. Okay, so interesting. Maybe people will be able to regrow limbs and stuff. Um, like there's this, uh, oh, nanotechnology with nanotechnology. Okay, so I mean, okay, I'm just gonna tell you this right now. What I'm gonna tell you is, is almost like unfathomable fathom fathomable from our current perspective. Like it's like humans are, so different on so many levels that it's like almost like we couldn't relate to it right now, but we can maybe kind of understand a little bit of what he's saying. So he's talking about nanotechnology becoming something that has been used for like hundreds of years and by then to repair cellular damage, to regrow limbs, to repair 
illnesses of all kinds. Oh, genetic. Oh, wow. Okay. We're going to be genetically engineered in ways that we can't imagine right now. Um, but it's interesting. There, there seems to be a sort of consciousness that feels so different from right now. It, it, there's not like, it's not like, it's not like Blade Runner or something. It's very, it's almost peaceful. It's, it's like, he's talking about how we're going to have to fall uh, down a bit with our use of technology. Like we're going to have to learn some hard lessons, but eventually it's like we have a renaissance of thinking and we realize that we don't have, it almost feels like there's a time where we might try to like ban technology, but in between, you know, leading up to this time, but then it's showing like a few hundred years before this third 30, 30 or whatever, there's, there's an understanding that actually we can harmonize, um, we can harmonize with it and, and almost use it to become more spiritual. It, it's, it's really weird. It's really weird, but yeah, sounds very futuristic, very like those but, futuristic but, but, movies, but nature is very heavily involved. It's almost like we are so, even though we're so technologically advanced, we value nature we value like our the way we treat disease it's just so different the way we raise our children the family structures are completely unrecognizable um so we definitely can clone people um there's genetically engineered people i mean wow there's just uh religions are just such a different thing like it's just i mean this stuff guys you wouldn't even recognize it it's it's remarkable how much we would have accomplished by then what he's showing so yeah, pretty nuts. Pretty, I mean, that's just some of the stuff, but yeah, because it would take forever to tell you everything. Well, awesome. Uh, that's all the questions I have, and that's all I see in the chat. And Maria, you have to go off and do reading. So <laughs> actually, so that's why we have to kind of um, wrap up. So um, again, if you guys want to book a session with her, you can visit Happy Healing Shop. And um, Ari did mention we're creating, developing our intuition and psychic abilities course. So um, I guess any last words, Grandpa, before we say bye-bye? He just said, thank you for being curious. <laughs> thank you for being curious. He really appreciates that. And he loves that. He loves I can't people. help it. I got it from you. Yeah. But to everybody here, he's saying like these, all these curious. Oh, wanting to learn. Yeah. Them. He, he's making a joke like, oh yeah, yeah, you're, you're on another level of training. We already know you're curious, <laughs> but, but yeah, just to keep having that curiosity because curiosity is our soul is really manifests from our soul's desire to, to really live and understand. So keep being curious. And he's so thankful that he got to talk to you all today and appreciates all your questions and getting to meet you. And he hopes to see you around again soon. <laughs> Great. And thank you for letting me be your medium for today. <laughs> thank you for bringing him in. And thank you guys for all coming out and uh, have a good night. Thanks everybody. <laughs> good seeing you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>